Welcome back to the course Corrosion Failures and Analysis. Today we have lecture 17 and we will continue our discussion on de-alloying or selective leaching. Uh, if you recall uh, in the last lecture, uh, we talked about de and we tried to look at the mechanism of de and if you see carefully, the de uh, starts with uh, dissolution of both the elements copper as well as zinc and then since copper has higher reduction potential compared to zinc, copper ion redeposits back. We have also seen the same ex example in case of uh, silver zinc where uh, silver as well as zinc dissolve and then silver deposits back leaving zinc in the form of ions in the solution. Now, we talked about two uh, schools of thoughts, uh, one school says that uh, both copper as well as zinc, uh, only zinc dissolves leaving copper behind or leaving noble metal, metal behind, but later on it was realized that uh, for that to happen you need to have a very high diffusion rate of zinc uh, coming from bulk to the surface, but which is not uh, possible at that room temperature. So, that is what uh, first few layers could be possible that zinc might dissolve preferentially, but in order to have such uh, quite a deep de-alloying uh, from the surface, uh, we need to have uh, both the elements to dissolve leaving uh, uh, only the active elements in the solution and redeposition of the noble elements on the surface of the metal. And in fact, uh, due to that de-alloying, uh, we have enrichment of the noble elements on the surface and also we create a nanoporous or porous structure. And then we also looked at the correlation between uh, de-alloying and porosity creation. Uh, in fact, also we looked at the correlation between pore bed diagram and de-alloying in case of silver zinc system with the experimental data. Okay. Uh, and the, at, the, at the end of the last lecture, if you recall that we talked about that this de-alloying mechanism or de-alloying process has been utilized in order for making uh, some of the exotic uh, uh, systems for catalytic activity like uh, nanoporous gold. Okay. So, in case of, uh, uh, in case of uh, one experimental process, though the application has not been found out yet, but we could make a nanoporous silver particles. Okay. So, each particle is nanoporous with the porosity level of uh, around close to 100 to uh, 150 nanometer. And each around 10 my nanometer, 10 micrometer to around 20 micrometer level particles, the entire silver particles are nanoporous. So, there is no zinc left in that. In fact, uh, in th some of the cases, uh, initial alloy composition was uh, silver 25 percent, zinc 75 percent, but at the end, uh, because of the novel processing, uh, we could get 100 percent silver starting from 25 percent in the uh, in the uh, base alloy composition. And also he said that uh, yes, this is advantageous uh, uh, in the modern applications of de-alloying. Uh, it is not uh, bad all the time, but of course, uh, in case of pipelines, brass pipelines, it is not good. There could be, pro there could be possibility of uniform de-alloying or plug type de-alloying and that would lead to a failure of that pipelines or leakage of the pipeline. So, that is not good. Okay. So, uh, uh, just let me uh, look at this particular de-alloying process little more. So, this course is corrosion failures analysis and in this case uh, today is lecture 17 and topic de-alloying or selective leaching and we will talk about uh, some of the uh, applications of de-alloying or maybe what can be done by through de-alloying process and also some of the protection processes 
in case of uh, brass uh, especially how to uh, stop de alloying because there de alloying uh, is not good. Okay. Now, let us uh, get back to some of the pictures if you see that we started looking at this particular slide where we talked about the uh, relation between Pobe diagram of silver and zinc and then finally, getting porous silver how we get it because it matches with the pH and potential requirement in the mixed Pobe diagram of silver and zinc where silver should stay as silver, but zinc should dissolve as zinc plus plus. But once we change the pH of the solution, the potential also changes uh, as we see in case of NaOH the way OCP changes to a lower value and that time we see that the pH of that higher pH solution and the potential of that alloy, it actually enables us to get uh, of a nano particle of zinc oxide. Okay. So, now uh, through the same line uh, what we have seen some of the pictures. So, this is one uh, nice picture we have made in the lab scale which is uh, nano rods of zinc oxide uh, while uh, de alloying uh, nickel 75 percent zinc okay, in 0 0.5 molar NaOH and we dip that particular uh, powder this is the alloy system uh, we made uh, via ball milling and we dipped in uh, 0.5 molar NaOH for 24 hours. Okay. And while we did that we got a nice uh, uh, kind of flower kind of structure. So, if you see each particle has become a kind of a flowery uh, structure which we call it as zinc oxide flowerets. Okay. So, this structure we got exactly in the similar process. What we did uh, in case of uh, uh, nickel, uh, nickel zinc system also we made use of this nickel Pobe diagram and zinc Pobe diagram and we saw that nickel starts leaving the see, uh, zinc starts leaving the surface. And in fact, nickel also starts leaving the surface in the form of nickel ions. And but since the pH is in that if you see the zinc oxide zinc pH diagram. So, this particular diagram if you look at. So, let me take that pH just a minute. So, I will let me take this particular pH uh, diagram on a separate page. Pobe, Pobe diagram, uh, here what we uh, if we see this particular uh, position this particular pH and uh, in case of nickel. So, the pH becomes here in this case nickel silver zinc system, but in case of nickel zinc system also this remains in the zinc oxide level. So, there in case of nickel zinc system because of that character of nickel zinc oxide does not form in the form of nano particles rather it forms as a form as if in the form of nano rods uh, which is hexagonal in nature if you see the cross section. Okay. So, that zinc nano rod if you see this particular each one is zinc oxide nano rods and this is hexagonal if you see the uh, top part of it cross section part of it hexagonal in nature. And the center part, the core part, there still nickel is left. Okay. So, it is a basically a on top of nickel zinc core, mostly nickel, uh, we have created zinc oxide nano rods. Fine. So, that also tells that both the elements go out into the solution, but in this particular case, because it is 0.5 molar NaOH solution, nickel actually should stay in the nickel form, but because of the interaction of those nickel plus plus and zinc plus plus what is there in the solution, nickel does not get the chance to redeposit back rather zinc redeposits back and then it reacts in that high pH solution with H 2 O and forms in H J N O 
and that J dot O actually forms in the form of nano rods. Now, this is again the uh, kind of application of Z, uh, so we have utilized the concept of dealloying to make this kind of structures. So, that is what I mean to say that corrosion is not all the time bad. For example, in case of dry cell, we get the voltage about 1.5 volt because of galvanic corrosion effect. The zinc cell which corrodes and the cathodic reaction happens on top of the center graphite or the carbon uh, on the carbon, carbon, carbon block. So, there we have cathodic reactions and that leads to a voltage of galvanic potential generation. So, that potential is the result of the galvanic effect, galvanic corrosion effects. So, that is the advantage I would say in the reverse in, 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 in a different manner I would say this is an advantage of because, because that situation is persisting we get that 1.5 volt for making the battery. So, we get electricity out of it. Now, in case of sacrificial protection of steel we make use of uh, zinc which has much active behavior in sea water and that zinc actually uh, corrodes and it protects steel structure. Okay. In fact, this zinc in case of uh, sea ships, uh, hulls and all, all those places they put zinc inserts. Okay. So, that inserts are actually fixed on top of it and that zinc inserts actually give you uh, sacrificial protection. So, this is also an application of galvanic corrosion okay, in protection of devices or the de protection of components or structures. Fine. So, this is one such example let me tell you we have done further studies and this zinc oxide nano rods can be taken out from the core. Okay. If we do a, a strong ultrasonic vibration those zinc oxide breaks open from the core and then free standing zinc oxide nano rods we could get and that nano rods we try to see uh, what is its effect in uh, uh, breaking methyl blue which is a kind of uh, bad things uh, uh, which is actually environment, not environmentally very uh, uh, environmentally very uh, dangerous uh, uh, component which is available in case of uh, when we have uh, uh, coloring plants. So, there this methyl blue it can crack those methyl blue and so that we can get a, a, a water which is free of methyl blue. So, that zinc oxide this zinc oxide has shown this property. So, that means starting with the nano uh, dealloying concept we could get this nanoporous uh, this nano this uh, zinc oxide fluorets on top of a nickel uh, core and then we could break open this zinc oxide nano rods and those nano rods were utilized in cracking methyl blue. Okay. So, this kind of application we can think of. Okay. So, you can you can actually make use of some bad things into a good thing. Okay. So, that is the major purpose of discussing this particular issue. Okay. So, now uh, uh, coming to uh, 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 applications this is coming to this dealloying phenomena in other uh, situations. For example, uh, if you take uh, steel let us say. Okay. So, there also you can sense dealloying. Uh, if you have heard of some of the structures what we get in uh, steel, let us say you take a carbon steel and in that carbon steel if you take 0 0.7 percent which is Indian rail steel around 0 0.7 percent 7 percent carbon. So, that is uh, uh, that microstructure if you uh, roll that rolled rail if you take it out and then uh, see the microstructure under ACM, you will see it is a parallelic microstructure, so almost 100 percent parallelic microstructure. Okay. Parallelite is a mixture of two phases, one is cementite, another one is ferrite. Uh, okay. So, that structure we get uh, my, or call it microstructure we get in parallelic microstructure in, in 0 0.7 percent carbon steel, which is uh, the typical composition of Indian rail steel, the carbon content of Indian rail steel. Indian rail steel is basically carbon manganese steel. Okay. So, now that steel you can you can make out those structure because of basically a galvanic effect that galvanic effect also leads to uh, dealloying. Okay. So, I will see that example even there could be another structure that you one can make that structure is called uh, uh, spheroidal uh, cementite structure spheroidal steel. So, that spheroidal steel is those cementite lamellin perlite 
that can be converted into small small spheroids. Okay. So, those spheroids will be sitting in the ferrite matrix. Okay. So, that structure has got a very high ductility. Fine. So, in if you compare the polytic uh, microstructure steel and spheroidal microstructure steel, the spheroidal microstructure steel will have a higher ductility. So, in those cases we do experience uh, this de-alloying effect. Okay. In fact, the de-alloying though it is uh, it's basically a specific, uh, it is basically removal of one element out of uh, the entire alloy systems. In case of, uh, uh, in case of uh, uh, polytic as well as spheroidal steel, we also see that it is basically a selective dissolution of iron leaving cementite behind. Okay. So, that also can fall under the regime of de-alloying. Okay. So, let us see some of the uh, examples. Uh, like uh, uh, if you see this structure, this is basically the left structure. So, this structure if you look at, this is a typical Indian rail steel structure. Fine. So, which is almost fully politic. This is etched in 3 percent nitrile. Okay. After uh, doing all the metallographic steps, and this is the book. This is the uh, paper you can refer. This is uh, the work of our group at IIT Kanpur. Uh, so now these structures, so these white things, those are carbides. See, it's written here. These white, white lamellars form. Pyrolite has a typical lamellar form. Those are carbides, and this gray part is basically ferrite. Okay. And ferrite is nothing but almost pure iron, since the carbon content is of the order of which is maximum carbon content 0 0.002 percent. So, that much of carbon is there in ferrite at room temperature. Okay. So, that is a very, very minor carbon content. So, you can say that it is almost pure iron. So, now and also if you see this is uh, actually low mag picture. So, the inside part, this is the part, this is the low mac picture, uh, this is also a SEM picture and if you see some uh, kind of boundary, this is the boundary. So, these are actually nothing but pre austenitic gain boundary, because while making this it was the steel was taken to uh, more than uh, 900, around 900 degree Celsius more than little more than 900 degrees Celsius and then uh, air cooled. Okay. So, that time that austenite that forms at around 900 degrees Celsius, I think around 800 to 850 around 850 to 900 degrees Celsius. So, the austenite grain forms there and when you cool it down, the pyolytic nucleation starts at the grain boundary or pre austenitic grain boundaries. Okay. So, that in uh, 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 along the grain boundary and that is what if you see each, each grains the pyolite uh, uh, orientation. So, are actually similar. So, for example, here the orientation is like this, here the orientation is like this. So, each grain you will find one set of orientations. Okay. So, that is what, uh, so those are actually a kind of it gives an indication that those are kind of uh, pre austenitic grain bound uh, grains okay, previously before pyolytic nucleation. Now, this structure is forming uh, because of etching. And what happens during etching? During etching, ferrite, if you compare the cementite, which is this is carbide or cementite, here the cementite, white portion, this is gray portion, gray portion and white portion cementite, which is Fe3C. Now, here ferrite and cementite, if you compare their potential or potential developing in 3.5 percent NaCl solution. So, this is done in 3 point, uh, this is done in nitrile, which is uh, uh, nitric acid uh, solution. Okay. So, there ferrite acts as anode. 
and cementite acts as cathode. So, of course, there will be uh, galvanic of effect and ferrite starts dissolving okay, along the along the lamellar portion. So, this particular portion basically those are the dissolved part little bit of dissolution happens and that is what you are developing a protrusion uh, around that cementite portion and that is what you could visualize or visualize those cementite and say ferrite because of the because of the typical such kind of uh, phenomenon galvanic effect rather. Now, after that this particular steel without etching see this is this is edge structure and if you if you do not etch you do not see those kind of structures it is a absolutely it will be a smooth structure you will not find any sort of features the way it has been developed here. Now, if you take that sample and you polarize ok. So, polarization is basically you are taking the potential E and this is log i that potential you are taking from low potential to high potential. Okay. So, this is the polarization simple dynamic polarization you are doing and after dynamic polarization we saw typical this kind of structure and interestingly here you see that some of the plate kind of structures you could see. Okay. So, these plates are nothing but cementite. Okay. So, those cementites are actually plate nature having a plate nature and that because of excessive dissolution of ferrite which is happening around this particular area which is basically called anodic polarization area. Polarization area. So, there you have excessive dissolution of ferrite which is happening forcefully okay, because we are forcefully taking the ferrite out. Here we are not doing forcefully because this etching is done at a normal corrosion potential which is rather we could call it open circuit potential. But here we are taking this ferrite out forcefully because there this particular action is taking place ferrite is acting as a anode and cementite is acting as a cathode and cementite does not dissolve, but ferrite dissolves leaving those plates as a free standard pa standing particles. Okay. So, that is what these plates are coming out on top of it and now actually this particular steel has been made into this same steel same composition same microstructure, but now since because of this electrochemical polarization to a high anodic potential we have taken the ferrite out it is a basically leaching the ferrite out which is nothing but the pure iron and then leaving cementite back behind. Okay. So, this is a typical case of de-alloying you can say which where iron comes out leaving the and cathode part behind, but here interestingly it is not about both the things are depositing dissolving back and one is depositing back it is basically the anodic component dissolves preferentially leaving the cathodic component back. So, this is happening because we are doing a forceful anodic polarization forceful taking out of ferrite part or pure iron part. So, here iron dissolution is taking place preferentially that is called that is why we can put it under de-alloying uh, effect. Okay. So, this is de-alloying effect is basically a result of galvanic corrosion. So, this is as a result of this de-alloying what we are getting is a result of galvanic effect. Okay. So, now another example let us look at. So, this is one of another structure which is spheroidal steel and here also the carbon content was 0 0.3 percent carbon which is weight percent weight percent and this is actually Indian rail steel. And if you want to know how it has been made you can look into this particular uh, paper which is our work. Okay. So, the work at IIT Kanpur. Now, this where what we have done if you see this particular structure and this particular structure. So, this was the structure in the beginning which is the fully polytic structure, 
and then we have broken those sparlites or the cementites okay cementite lamellae we have broken by doing heat treatment and then we have made small small spheres or near spherical uh, or a kind of elliptical uh, ellipsoid rather uh, those cementite particles have formed in the ferrite matrix again it's the mixture of ferrite plus i can say spheroidal cementite which is fe 3 c and this is pure iron fine now similar way this is actually aged structure aged in 3 percent nitrile okay so this is uh, uh, in nitrile aged solution there also dissolution of ferrite happens but not to a aggressive extent only the surface dissolution takes place and that is what you have these features. And if you do not do any etching, if you see under microscope, you do not see anything. Now, once we do dealloying in the by the way of uh, polarization, again we do such kind of polarization and after polarization, we saw this structure and remember after polarization in the previous example, where we talk about 100 percent power light, there also we have not done any etching. So, that polarization actually led to that structure. Here also, there was no etching after polarization. It is a basically on each sample polarized and then we look it under microscope ACM. And here you could see that the cementite particles can be clearly visible. So, the each one is a cementite particle and if you would see that those cementite particles are actually hanging if you see those are hanging cementite particles and some cementite particles it since it has started from a lamellar cementite some of the cases it could not break open. So, you could see a long uh, cementite uh, a part of that lamella is still existing, but many of them have actually turn into a small small spheroids or ellipsoids. Okay. So, those are actually structures this is again happening because it is a preferential dissolution of pure iron okay. pure iron dissolves and leaving behind cementite this is also a galvanic effect since ferrite act as anode and cementite acts as cathode and preferential dissolution of anode happens leaving behind the sphero spheroids of cementite. Okay. This is also a typical example of you can say the typical example of a de-alloying of pure iron leaving cementite behind. Okay. So, in that aspect you can say the first logic where it says that pure, pure element goes out so the active element goes out and that noble element stays back here cementite is not an element it is a kind of compound, but still we say that noble element preferentially goes out exact similar situation happens in case of cast iron. Okay. So, cast iron is nothing but iron carbon uh, uh, alloy system where carbon stays in the form of graphite not in the form of cementite. Okay. So, during that period also graphite is also highly cathodic to ferrite. Okay. So, when it happens ferrite dissolves leaving behind graphites and if you take a spheroidal graphite iron which is called SG iron if you put it in acid you will see after some time at the bottom of that particular container you will see black uh, uh, dark black uh, graphite uh, particles are there because in case of spheroidal graphite iron we have cement type this uh, graphite in the form of spheroids. So, once those dissolves those graphites falls off. Okay. So, that falling off fall, falling off of graphite leads to the graphite deposits at the at the, at the, at the, at the bottom, but if in, in case of uh, gray cast iron where the graphite forms in the form of uh, needles okay, uh, those cases and it is a basically uh, those cases graphite is not able to fall off rather it stays back because there is an interconnection or mechanical locking of those graphite flex. 
So, that is what the graphite plate stays back and you will see the color changes to a grayish mode and if you mark with that particular graphite on a white paper, you will see that the way marking happens when you use a pencil, similar marking happens when you use gray cast iron. So, we will talk about that gray cast iron part uh, in our next lecture. So, till then you could see that other system in steel also we can experience uh, de alloying. Okay. But in case of graphite, uh, in case of gray cast iron or uh, SG iron, we will see uh, how it forms the way I have just explained a little bit. So, we will take this explanation in the next lecture. Uh, thank you.